Good evening. We'll be back in Romans chapter 8. In the last section that we covered, we left off with, well, I'm going to read what Paul had had written just to kind of give us back our context where we're at. Verse 16, chapter 8, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I'm not completely sure if at this time Paul was still penning his own letters or if he was dictating. Do you know where he was at at this point? Because I know he was still penning. Because like the way this these verses break here, it almost seems like he was interrupted and asked the question. Suffering? Because he was going to pick up here in our text tonight, almost like stopping and explaining what he just said. So let's take a look at that. Indeed, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Verse 18, for I consider that suffer that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious long of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who was subjected it, and hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption and to the freedom of glory, of the glory of the children of God. He seems to kind of just take a pause for a second. He wants to elaborate what the suffering is. And so, on the surface, we can immediately just kind of take a look at life as we see it. How do we suffer today? How do we suffer in our life in this world? Often it's simple things as results of sin. The sin in our lives comes back, and the consequences of it often cause suffering. There's more obvious things, sickness, losses, whether that's financial, material, or family and friends, losing family and friends. Persecution, whether it's you're a missionary and now you're in jail for being a Christian in a foreign country, or if it's something as simple as being ostracized because he's one of those Bible thumpers. There's also just, as King Solomon wrote, the, he looked upon the world and with the wisdom that he was given by, by God, he just kind of took a look across his kingdom and he said, vanity. That l- word would later be gr- translated into the Greek to the very word that we see in our text here, which is futility, pointless, hopeless. Everything here, all, all, a lot of the efforts and the things that we are so concerned about right now and the grand scope of things and the, eter- and the scope of eternity, it's vanity, it's futile. And the suffering that we see is a result of a lack of hope. That, that's the thing, that's why the world suffers. The reason the world goes through its suffering, goes through its turmoil, is those that don't have Christ in their lives, these, this is the outlook they have. It's futile. What's the point? Why worry about it? Who cares? I'm not worried about it. Or the other side of the thing is they are far too worried about it. They are living in fear. And the, what is that fear? What, what are they afraid of? Not knowing. They don't know. They don't know what's to come. They don't know what is around the corner for them. They don't know what, is, what it is after this life. After I've done everything and toiled and did my best, 
what next? That is the fear. That is ultimately what fear is, is not knowing. And it kind of came as a, uh, as I was going through this text, I also, for fun, have been reading the works of H.P. Lovecraft. And as I was reading through this, the man basically defined fear as the fear of the unknown. One of his often quoted, uh, things he's often quoted for in 1927, he said that the oldest and strongest emotion mankind has is fear. And the oldest and strongest kind of fear is of the unknown. And that, as I was reading several of his writings, that's his whole basis for writing his horror genre was it isn't someone getting killed or a murderer or somebody chasing somebody. All of his characters are literally losing their minds with fear because they don't understand what they're dealing with. And I see that as a very relatable thing to those that have no hope in Christ. They don't know what they're dealing with. They don't know how to, to move forward, how to face what is to come because they're living in a fear of the unknown. And I think that is what we're seeing here is that is the greatest suffering that people face. Now, as Paul goes through, he says for himself, for I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Now, we can often look at ourselves and think, man, I've had it hard. I've, I've faced a lot of tr troubles and turmoil in my life. But you got to remember, this is a man that spent most of his time shackled trying to write with chains. This is a man that was beaten to, de beaten to death, dragged out in the city and left for the vultures and woke back up and, well, let's keep going. This is a man that faced persecution. He faced suffering. And even he says it, there's no comparison to the glory. There's no comparison to what is to come. And so, this glory that he speaks of has him in such great spirits compared to what he's dealt with. He goes on, for the anxious longly, for the anxious longing of the creation of, of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. So he's trying to relate now. He's trying to, to reach out to everybody and and he takes it in the perspective of creation itself, the whole world, not just mankind, the creation. They, the creation itself <coughs> subjected to futility and not willingly. So everything we see around us, the great creation, I mean, if you've gone out and seen some of the marvels that this world has to offer, he's telling you, it's subjected to the same thing. It's all futile. It's fallen. It's corrupted. And, and so, what, what do we mean by it, the futile? Well, let's go ahead and jump over to science for a second. See what they have to say. If you remember the laws of thermodynamics, may have been a while back, because I actually had to go look it up myself. But all matter is in a constant state of breaking down. It's all corrupted. It's all falling apart. Except for, <laughs> Except for evolution. That's improving somehow. But that's the second law of thermodynamics. That's actually what we've been able to perceive about the world around us, about creation. Is In all its beauty, every bit of it is falling apart. That is just a law of our universe. And so it's facing the same corruption. It's facing the same futility. It is not meant to last. 
So, <coughs> excuse me. So, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery of corruption in the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So, all of creation has been subjected to the same thing. For what purpose? For it to have the hope of what is to come. And so now, this hope that is to come, if you're not in the Christian mindset, if you don't have the worldview that we hold here, that hope is nothing. The creation itself is all pointing to the hope. Without that worldview, without that Christian mindset that we discussed before, without the, the spirit in the mind, you look to a hopelessness, a world of fear. And so now, what we see people turn to in the world starts to make a little bit more sense. They start turning to drugs, alcohol, materialism. They're looking for something that takes their mind away from the futility. And so, in a sense, without that hope, all these things, even as destructive as they may be, they make more sense than to face the world head on, just buckle down and deal with it. But in the end, it's all pointing to the same thing. It's pointing to that futility. Why is it pointing to that futility? So that you would wake up and see what you can hope for. And so, let's look here. That creation itself would also be set free from its slavery of corruption and to the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. To be freed from that slavery of corruption. So that because we know, speaking of the believers, we know that the whole creation groans and suffers for the pains of childbirth together until now. It's gro suffering, it's groaning, it's pushing forward, it's trying to get past where it's at in that hope. This is the same life that we live. We live through our lives in suffering. We, we face hardships, we face turmoil, just as Christ did. He lived a life as a man. He stubbed his toe, he was hungry, he was tired. Even the Apostle Paul, who was beaten and eventually beheaded for his beliefs was suffering but he had the hope that was the that was the goal that is the point of creation itself even today we hear more and more about volcanic eruptions earthquakes natural disasters sicknesses pandemics it's all the birthing pains it is the suffering before the hope that is to come And so, and not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown with the, in ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, for hope that for who hopes for what they are, he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. <clears throat> we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, we have that spirit, we have that mindset. He's, he's pointing out the key difference between us and the rest of the world. 
We have the, the first fruits of the Spirit. We have that mind. It is the, yes, it is that the Spirit being there. You now have a different, we've, as we've looked at in the past chapters, having that mind of the Spirit changes your world outlook. It changes everything about you. It changes the way you see things, the way you go about your life. And with that Spirit, even ourselves, we groan within ourselves. Who all here is just like, come now. Lord Jesus, come now. I've had enough. I'm done. This has been enough. Surely this is all, all we got to do. Can we, can we move forward to the next step here? Can we step on? Can we go on here? Apparently one person's kind of been there. Nobody else? <laughs> okay, maybe it's just me. <coughs> we groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons. Remember, we were just talking about that. It's a relationship. We are in a relationship with God. Not just a relationship that is, he is our king. We are his children. We are his heirs. Princes and princesses are sitting in this room right now. We are the children of God, children of the king. He is our father. He is our brother. He is our friend. That relationship, having that relationship, we are just now, we're just waiting for that official adoption. That official adoption is the change this body goes. Whether it's laid in the ground or it's changed in the moment in a twinkle of an eye. We, we see that in the last days when the, he returns, first are those that are, as Christ put it, asleep. Those that have already passed. They are with God. They're just they don't have that new body yet. They're just waiting for that last day. They receive their bodies first, and then we are taken up with them. And in, in a moment, that new body, that glorified body, that no longer suffers, that is no longer in pain. We were talking right before the service. We have injuries. We have sickness. Even my, me and myself up here right now, Kind of have to stop and take a breath every few minutes because I was sick not too long ago. <laughs> that ain't the case anymore. The suffering ends. That is the hope. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is, that is seen is not hope. There's the thing. You got a brand new car. Do you hope for a new car? You, when you, at any time, you don't hope for what is our, you've already attained. Yeah. <coughs> Have you really attained it if you're paying on it, though? <laughs> and that's the thing, is that we are hope, our hope is in the future. We have something to strive for. It is said and done. You're a believer in Christ. It is said and done. It is a done deal. It's just we're waiting on the time. We're just waiting. We're anxiously waiting. We, as he later puts it, perseverance. Paul was a man of sports. We read throughout his letters, he always gives a sports reference here and there. <laughs> one of my favorite writings of his is talking about running the race I think that is a great analogy of our lives and our faith is we're running a race keep going forward his analogy doesn't talk about winning the race he talks about finishing the race we've already won we just got to cross the line that's but for hopes for what we have already seen, but if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. So now it's just a minute, as he's saying, it's a perseverance. We're just waiting. It's just waiting it out. We have that hope. And so if you look, next time you're with those that aren't a believer, I'd hope that you kind of see the difference in worldview now. 
It isn't you poor pathetic sinner. It's sorry you're living in that futility. I'm sorry you don't have that hope. Let me give you that hope. I deal with a lot of people in my line of work. I, I show up to homes and it's like, you did it again, really? We're here again at this? How much did you drink this time? What was it that shot in your vein this time? I deal with it all the time seeing this and it's, they know that it's not the best, but they just look for that escape. They're looking for that moment away from facing the futility. And so that, that's where we need to be in our mindset is it's not us against them, it's us helping them. Show them that hope. Show them where they can find something to look forward to. Yeah, he's, and that's why he's right here. He, he, he himself said right here that he eagerly groans within himself to be at that end hope. But he had his job to do here, and we do too. We have that job to share that hope. And so... With that, where is your hope now? Where is, are you living in that fear of the unknown? If so, pray. Get into that relationship that we talked about, that relationship that is beyond all others that we can have. One as a, an heir to the king, as a brother to the to the son of God, a friend, that relationship. Not a relationship of, oh, great heavenly father, but, hey, dad, daddy, that close relationship. Let's look to that. And then once you have that relationship, you have that hope. And it's no longer a living of fear. I kind of had my own check in my own life back with those storms that we had, those tornadoes. At first, I was deathly afraid that I'm being called out. Or is a, the, wor- the largest tornado in history cutting across our county? But I had to take that moment, that moment of prayer that God protect me, save me. And, I'm, and that's when it, it seems like he said, wait, what did you say? Save you? You're already saved. And it was that realization, that, that fear was gone. Now, was I worried that some, something would happen? Yeah, I was kind of worried that this is going to hurt if it goes bad. But the fear was gone. That fear, that dread was gone. Because right here, what am I afraid of? Am I afraid that my life will end? I mean, I'm sure there's a lot more I could have done, but hey, the king said, come home. And that's the faith that we have to have. That is the hope that we need to keep in us. And with that, just remember the hope. We'll stop there and we will try to finish out chapter eight next, not next week, I work next week. Three weeks from now? Something like that. I don't know. My, my work schedule's gone all over the place. So. <laughs> but we'll pick, pick up and finish chapter eight in the near future. <laughs> so, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the hope. And we, we just hope that this birthing pains will soon be come to an end, that we will soon be rejoined with you to be with you in your heavenly kingdom. Lord, as the suffering does go on around us, we just remember that we just come to you. We turn to you. We face, take, take all our worries to you. And Lord, as it was brought up before the service here, 
uh, Larry, who's having health problems, got some bleeding problems. We just want to lift him up, lift the family up, that they will be able to uh, have skilled doctors that are led by you to find, find the solution to these health problems. And we just ask that you just touch that family and give them a sense of peace and give a relief to Larry as he's going through what I can only imagine is a hard time. Lord, I just want to lift up all those that are here as we depart this evening, that you'd give them peace, you'd give them a deeper, deeper connection to you, that you just reach out to them, touch their hearts, and just build that relationship and renew that hope in them. And Lord, we just want to lift all things up to you. In Jesus' name, amen.